Hello, everybody. I think we do can start. I just shared in the chat with you the YouTube link because all um, CCSA talks can be watched afterwards on our YouTube channel. And I will quickly introduce the CCSA for those who may not know it. It's a the Center for Critical Studies and Architecture. It's a research cooperation between the architecture department of the Technical University of Darmstadt, the art history department of the Goethe University in Frankfurt am Main and the Deutsches Architekturmuseum also in Frankfurt am Main. And um, including team members from the University of Applied Science and Arts in Dortmund, from Heidelberg University, from University of Kassel and the Karlsruhe Institute of technology, so we kind of expanded a bit. CCSA Talks is a format um, to discuss publicly, but in a smaller circle, research projects and publications. And we are very happy that today we can welcome Ezan Kahani, um, who is a PhD candidate in architecture at Shahid Beheshti University in Tehran. He is an architect and holds a Master of Architecture History from 2017. And he was a visiting researcher at Lund University in 2022, so last year. And he is currently finishing a doctoral thesis on the history of autonomy and criticality in architecture theory in US American journals in the second half of the 20th century. And this is um, what you is and will present today, right? And um, we are very happy to have you here, and um, the stage is yours, so feel free to, to start. Thank you very much, uh, Frederick, for your introduction. And yes. uh, I would like to thank you all for participating in this meeting and especially thanks to Daniela and Frederick for giving me this opportunity to uh, present part of my PhD uh, project, uh, which is uh, actually the title of our presentation today is An Assemblage of Any Oppositions, A Quest for Autonomy and Criticality in Late 20th Century Architectural Theory. Uh, my presentation is actually uh, divided to four uh, chapters. The first chapter is an introduction. First, an introduction to my PhD project. Second, an introduction to the presentation topic. And then I will give a preliminary history of autonomy and criticality. However, before I discuss the topics of this talk, uh, I want to introduce my PhD project, which is entitled Rethinking the Two Central Concepts in Architectural Theory and the Relationship Between Them, Autonomy and Criticality. My main questions are, what are the roots and instances of criticality and autonomy in architectural theory? What are the different relations between criticality and autonomy? And on what arguments are these relationships based? And how can the concepts of autonomy and criticality be reconsidered in the context of contemporary architectural theory in order to become useful? Actually, I'm in the final stage of my research. I'm, right now, I'm writing down my thesis right now. And this is a project supervised by Professor Tafazzoli and Professor Nadimi at Shahid Behesht University. But talking about the time frame and my main sources of this research, my PhD research, the time frame is between 1973 to 2002, and my main sources are oppositions, perspective, any, and assemblage, and other secondary sources. Uh, then 1973 is the year uh, of the publication of the first issue of oppositions, and 2002 is the year of publication of uh, perspective issue 33 called Mining Autonomy which according to many historians and uh, theorists, it is actually the end of criticality era and start of the post-critical era. So uh, my focus in my PhD is on these four American journals, but in this presentation, I mostly focus on oppositions, assemblage, and any. Also, I was fortunate to be a guest researcher last year at 
uh, Lund University's Department of Architecture and Built Environments. And also I was fortunate again to present some of my uh, PhD results in, in a seminar, in an ABM seminar, entitled Apocalypse Then, Autonomy and Criticality in Architectural Theory, which was introduced first by Per Johandal and after that, uh, panelists, uh, Per Johandal and Gunnar Sandin, actually, we had a very good discussion about my project and it was a very good experience. But I want to start uh, my uh, presentation uh, first from a general definition of the two concepts, autonomy and criticality. According to editor's statement in Perspective 33, autonomy is the belief that architecture is a self-contained project with its own legible meaningful forms. And also according to Ole W. Fisher, criticality takes architectural design, edifices or the built environment as a starting point for a fundamental problematization of the discipline that is an interrogation of the practice of architecture. According to many theorists, the term autonomy actually entered architectural theory uh, in 1933, and it was coined by Emil Kaufman. But uh, actually, uh, according to historians, this was some sort of formal autonomy. Talking about formal autonomy, we have another uh, actually branch in uh, autonomous architecture and understanding autonomy, which could be defined as non-formal or disciplinary autonomy. It is emerged actually in, in the late 1960s with uh, Architecture of the City, the book by Aldo Rossi. The following year, the book Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture was published, uh, which was written by uh, Robert Venturi. Also in 1967, we have the establishment of Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies by Peter Eisenman and his colleagues. And also we have a book in 1968 by Manfredo Tafuri, Theories and History of Architecture, which actually proposing somehow uh, an opposition to uh, the autonomy of architecture that was understood by IAUS and uh, kind of, we can say, Aldo Rossi. Also, I want to mention two uh, major museum events or exhibitions. The first one is the 15th Triennale in Milan, uh, actually Rational Architecture, the name, and it was curated by Aldo Rossi. And also in 1972, uh, the exhibition at Museum of Modern Art, entitled Italy, the New Domestic Landscape, and curated by Emilio Ambosch, actually was another very important um, conference and exhibition about autonomy and about how actually autonomy entered in the United States and understood uh, by theorists of, uh, by American theorists. Uh, Rossi's assertion of the existence of an autonomous architectural knowledge raised the cultural question of a critical practice of architecture. Massimo Scolari, a, a colleague of Aldo Rossi, proposed actually some sort of idea for the first time that the autonomy of architecture can also lead to the criticality of architecture. And this affinity was claimed in a text written by him for the exhibition catalog. A quotation actually by Scolari, architecture is a cognitive process that in and of itself, in the acknowledgement of its own autonomy, now necessitates a refounding of the discipline, one that refuses interdisciplinary solutions to its own crisis that does not pursue and immerse itself in political, economic, social, and technological events only to mask its own creative and formal astrality, but rather desires to understand them so as to be able to intervene in them with lucidity. Actually, uh, Scolari tried to define a critical condition for the strategy of architecture's autonomization. And according to uh, Marco de Michelis, Maybe this is the first time or this is the first text where the idea of autonomy and criticality of architecture are actually uh, coming together and you know understood somehow related to together. I want to talk also about a brief background review about a dialectical history uh, about the history of autonomy and history of criticality. 
According to Pierre Vittorio Orelli in his book The Project of Autonomy, Politics and Architecture Within and Against Capitalism, there are two different kinds of, uh, two different projects of autonomy. First is the one that's applied to politics and the second is the one applied to the city or in other term to poetics. Also about a history of criticality, I want to actually uh, uh, actually uh, tell about what Jeffrey Kipnis actually um, um, defines this history, which is some sort of dialectic between semiotics and institutional criticism. Also another very important dialectic is uh, the difference between critical versus post-critical, which was um, uh, which could be understood as projective, and this is a term coined by Robert Sommel and Sarah Whitening in their seminal article notes around the Doppler effect and other moods of modernism. They believe in a, uh, actually in, in an architecture maintaining criticality while it is actually projective. And they say that disciplinarity has been absorbed and exhausted by the project of criticality. In my second chapter, I would like to um, give an introduction to op Opposition's journal. Then I will talk about significant articles and controversies. And then I will focus on two articles by Peter Eisenman. The first one is post-functionalism, and the second is about self-referentiality. Opposition's was uh, the architectural journal produced by the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies, IAUS from 1973 to 1984. 26 issues were produced during this, uh, this lifespan, and it was edited by Peter Eisenman, Kenneth Frampton, Mario Gandelsonos, Anthony Whitler, Kurt W. Forster, and Diana Agres. Also, in, in oppositions, we can find so many um, intellectual projects by, uh, by architects and theorists, such as Peter Eisenman's projects uh, about formal operations and notations. We have the project of Kenneth Frampton's critique of the modern and contemporary cultural industries, Mario Gandelsona's ideological semiotic analysis, Anthony Widler's institutional and typological studies, and Kurt Forster's materialist historiography. As well as these theorists, we have, we have texts from Colin Rowe and Manfred de Tafuri. But actually, I want I want to focus on two uh, on two articles by Peter Eisenman. The first is is an ed editorial post functionalism, and the second one is is the uh, actually self referential sign, which in my opinion completes the post functionalism article. So, uh, Peter Eisenman starts his uh, editorial for Opposition Six, which was published in 1976 with the fact that humanism is characterized by a dialectical opposition, a, an opposition between a concern for internal accommodation, which could be understood as somehow a program in architecture, and a concern for articulation of ideal themes in form, which could be understood as plan. He then argues that with the rise of industrialization, this balance between program and plan actually kind of fundamentally disrupted. And uh, there was a necessity to come to terms with problems of a more complex functional nature. This shift actually in, in balance has produced a situation whereby architects have understood design as the product of some oversimplified form follows function formula. So actually the, the dialectical uh, relationship between form and function is kind of a result of the imbalance caused by industrialization. Eisenman argues that modernism as a sensibility based on the f uh, fundamental displacement of man and represents a non-humanistic attitude toward the relationship of an individual to his uh, physical environment. This new theoretical base changes the humanist bal balance of form function to a dialectical relationship within the evolution of the form itself. And in understanding this evolution, there is also another dialectic between understanding this evolution as a transformation 
from some pre-existent geometric or platonic solid or understand, uh, understanding it as uh, something atemporal compositional form. So here Pro uh, Eisenman proposes a new dichotomy or a new dialectic, which is the way actually we understand the evolution of form in uh, humanism or non-humanism. Actually, he uh, states these facts that form is understood as a series of fragments, signs without meanings dependent upon and without reference to a more basic condition. So modernism as a sensibility actually has some aspects in, in Peter Eisenman's idea. And one of those aspects that Peter Eisenman states see, three years later after the previous article is uh, the the self-referentiality. Speaking of modernism sensibility, there is a condition of modernism called self-referentiality. In this article, Aspects of Modernism, Mason Domino and the Self-Referential Sign, Peter Eisenman actually uses close reading as well as formal analysis method of Colin Rowe, but at the same time he does not accept his assumptions. But talking about the self-referential sign, He's arguing and he's starting with uh, actually with the diagram of a domino house. And he proposes that it is possible to see in the precise selection, size, number and location of the elements in the domino diagram, the preliminary presence of the self-referential sign. Analysis, his analysis actually begins with the basic elements uh, the three horizontal slabs, six box-like footings, six linear columns, and one staircase in a primitive geometric configuration. At the beginning, Eisenman explains that architecture and geometry are different, and this difference is at a precise level of intentionality. For example, the dimensions of any rectilinear plane can be designated simply by two notations, AA or AB, as you can see in, in the first, in the figure one, it could be AA or AB. But actually, if the dimensions of a plane are AB and this dimension is marked, then this marking can be considered intentional and then it will be a sign of that condition. So, Quotation, the, pre the presence of an international intentional sign may be the most important quality which distinguishes architecture from geometry, distinguishes an intention to be something more than a notation of a physical presence from the facts of literal existence. Another example by Peter Eisenman is about the precise location of the columns with respect to the slab which reveals again an, an intention to show us the AB proportion. Because the columns are also in an AB relationship, actually this shows us that it is a sign that signals that there is something present other than either the geometry or the function of the column and the slab. For example, we can see in the diagrams uh, that in the diagram number five, which is the diagram of the uh, domino house, we have this proportion of AB again in, in the distance between the columns and the edge of the slabs. But if the number of columns would be four, it would be actually a sign of a square, not a rectangle, That's, that is uh, the AB proportion. And other alternatives, Peter Eisenman tries to show us every alternative and then asserts that this is the exact number five figure that should be in the uh, domino house diagram and this shows intentionality and some sort of self-referentiality. Uh, in his opinion, self-referentiality is the architecture generating an autonomous language referring to its own body of knowledge and not to external values. This is actually the most, the, the most fundamental dialectic of oppositions according to uh, Michael Hayes that he defines it as a dialectic between autonomy against history. In third chapter, I will talk about assemblage. Uh, after an introduction to the journal, I will uh, refer to Stanford Anderson and Michael Hayes as, some of, as two of the main representatives of uh, the journal. 
And then I will talk about criticality and semi-autonomy in order for us to understand if there is any new dialectical was proposed by these theorists or not. Assemblage published, uh, was published by MIT Press from 1986 to 2000. Michael Hayes and Alicia Kennedy actually were the main editors of the 41 issues and other edit editors included Katrin Ingraham, Stan Allen, Sarah Whitening and other architects uh, actually in, in, in the, uh, the lifespan of 1986 to 2000. But by looking at the table of contents of the first issue of Assemblage, we can understand that this publication and this periodical actually seeks to express a middle way between an absolute autonomy and a new term, which is critical architecture. For example, looking at Stanford Anderson's um, article, Critical Conventionalism in Architecture, uh, which I believe that this is the, the project that's finished in, uh, in his article in 2002 uh, named Quasi-Autonomy. Actually, he tries to propose a, a way that we you know, keep our distance from the belief of an absolute autonomy. And actually, while believing in some sort of middle autonomy or quasi-autonomy, practicing critically in architecture. But in order to better understand what was the main argument, in my opinion, of this uh, publication, of this journal, maybe we'd better focus on Michael Hayes. His first article that, uh, that is so famous is the article Critical Architecture Between Culture and Form in Perspective 21, published in 1984. Uh, Michael Hayes discusses the work of Miss van der Rohe in this article. And he stresses that on the fact that uh, Miss, Miss Architecture was based on an autonomous moment of architecture, which locates its architecture on, on, on the criticality and, you know, in, in its very autonomy. He, he the Miss, Miss van der Rohe actually placed his architecture in a critical position first between a culture as a massive body of self-perpetuating ideas and forms supposedly free of circumstance. Uh, he says, actually Michael Hayes, a critical position for architecture, distinguishing architecture from the forces that influence architecture, the conditions established by the market and by taste, the personal aspirations of its author, its technical origins, even its purpose as defined by its own tradition. But the next article by uh, Michael Hayes, which I believe is so important in his um, actually proposing a new dialectic or birth of a new dialectic, is his editor editorial for Assemblage 30 in 1996. This editorial was published on, on the 10th anniversary of Assemblage. He starts the article by focusing on the importances of uh, uh, actually assemblage and what assemblage did to a critical uh, to architectural theory first it was a shift to cri to cultural criticism it was a shift actually from linguistics and semiotics based problematic dominant in the 1970s to new affinities with uh, cultural criticism concerns such as textual strategies constructions of subjectivity and gender a power and property, geopolitics, and other themes that were already part of the general post-structuralism discourse. Second, to understand architecture as a subject, and it was the emphasis on the earlier theory on the production of architectural objects that give way to an emphasis on the production of architecture as a subject of knowledge. And the third one, which is very important, is to understand autonomy just as an apparatus and you know, somehow rejecting uh, an absolute autonomy. Architecture's specific forms, operations, and practices could now more clearly be seen as, produ as producing concepts whose ultimate horizon of effect lay outside of architecture proper situated in a more general socio-cultural field. At the end, uh, Michael Hayes actually presents his opinion about a new dialectic. 
any theory that talks about architecture only that does not relate architecture to the larger social material field is utterly useless. At the same time, any theory that does not articulate the concrete specificity and semi-autonomy of architecture's codes and operations misses a major medium of social practice. The two parts of this assertion, that architecture is autonomous and heteronomous, are not contradictory. They are, however, dialectical and I, for one, maintain a commitment to dialects, even though I understand that it is not without certain problems. So it seems like that Michael Hayes' idea about a new dialectic to understand the architecture and architectural discipline and again architectural practice is not the way to how to understand actually the formal evolution or humanism against non-humanism or even uh, a dialectic of autonomy versus history. It is for Michael Hayes autonomous versus a heteronomous idea toward architecture. But in the fourth chapter, in the last one, I want to talk about any and to find if there is any uh, neo-dialectic there about architecture and about autonomy and criticality or not. After an introduction to any magazine, I will talk about uh, Ignacy Sola Morales and also Peter Eisenman, our usual suspect, and then about post-criticality and a return to uh, the, the origins of uh, autonomy and criticality. Any magazine was the architectural journal published by Any One Corporation from 1993 to 2000, and a total of 27 issues were published. Also, they also held a series of conferences, usually curated by Cynthia Davidson, and exhibition catalogues, which are good sources for my research. And I would start with one of those conferences, actually the first Any Conference in 1991, and a canonical lecture by Ignacy Sola Morales, which was about a new approach in architecture and actually a, a proposing a shift from previous theories to new set of theories derived by Deleuze philosophy. Um, Sola Morales actually starts his uh, article and his lecture actually by structuralism and uh, to, dis to describe and explain how structuralism ended in autonomy and criticality in architecture. Also, he continues talking about liberalism as the content of an architecture that was well received by technocrats and high-tech architecture. But his idea is some sort of untimely architecture, which is there is also an untimely architecture born out of time without regard to any system of principles, traditions, or linguistic codes. It is that which, for good reason, presents a radical desolation, a groundlessness emerging out of the singularity of an event. So we have here a post-structuralism that Morales proposes, which is based on the loose and crosses structuralism and deconstructive post-structuralism. And this is, a, this is an attempt, actually, to to have a non-dialectical approach in architectural theory. Also, we can talk about uh, another project, which is counter-critical. And it could be uh, said that this was started by Rem Kulhas, again in any conference in 1994, and his uh, very famous um, phrase that the problem with the prevailing discourse of architectural criticism is the inability to recognize there is in the deepest motivations of architecture something that cannot be critical. This view about actually something counter-critical ended in being completely post-critical. And I believe that this is a project that uh, ended by Michael Speaks with his famous uh, article, Design Intelligence and the New Economy, and Robert Sommel and Sarah Whitening uh, idea about a projective architecture. But let's go back to Peter Eisenman and uh, what he did during this time of uh, 1993 of any until the end of the century. I understand the uh, different chapters of uh, Peter Eisenman's idea about autonomy as the first one which was uh, some sort of formalism plus structuralism 
and then go into deconstruction and some sort of deconstructive autonomy. But in the third chapter, I believe that this is this is a new project by Peter Eisenman that could be called historical avant-garde. In his uh, article in 1997, Eisenman actually kind of returned to the origins of autonomy and proposes a historical version that includes the view of Aldo Rossi plus Robert Venturi at the same time. Also, about uh, other concepts and other terms that Peter Eisenman uh, introduced to architectural theory at this time, we can talk about canon in architecture, which could be understood as some sort of paradigm shift in architecture. Also, uh, his insistence on process, the importance of process, the importance of the diagram, and also focusing on cutting architecture from previous modes of legitimation. But I think a, a very good sum up for his idea about the, the relationship between autonomy and criticality could be found in his uh, article called Autonomy and the Will to the Critical. In other words, criticality can be understood as the striving or the will to perform or manifest architecture as autonomy. According to this logic, the critical does not rely on an external subjective judgment of taste or value but a necessary internal articulation of a figural condition which is singular to architecture's autonomy. So this looks like that his uh, sum up with this simple suggestion that architecture can perform radical and critical gestures by concentrating on its own formal logic could be actually a, a sum up for uh, Peter Eisenman's history of uh, practicing and, you know, thinking about autonomy and criticality. But I actually, uh, to finish my presentation, I would like to focus on his uh, current project, Peter Eisenman's current project, which I believe that it is, again, about criticality. And, you know, I, be, I mean, criticality states some sort of <clears throat> the ongoing project for him in architecture, as well as some some of the keywords that we have found, for example, in Ignacy Solomorales' idea, which is untimeliness. Let's focus on his introduction for his latest book, uh, Lateness, published in 2020. This essay proposes lateness as a possible different attitude toward form and time in architecture, one that attempts to circumvent stylistic constraints and expand the critical capacity of architecture through the notion of untimeliness. So it seems like that this is an ongoing project to, to actually find critical capacities of architecture. And, um, you know, it could be in autonomy, it could be in, un, in untimeliness, it could be everywhere in many keywords, but it seems like this, this is the, the current project of Peter Eisenman. Thank you very much for listening and I'm eagerly awaiting your inquiries and feedback. Thank you very much, Ethan. Um, so you all have the, I mean, you are all invited to ask questions. So um, feel free to use the, um, the hand or um, just write in the chat as you, as you prefer. And as I know, it's always difficult to ask the first question. I, I would like to start and um, I would like to ask you about your own critical position, because since you're writing about um, criticality, I would like to know, do you see what you're researching the past, um, yeah, like 40 years almost or even more? Or 30, 30 to 40 years, what is what is your critical position to all these different positions? And I wanted to ask, why have you chosen to look at journals? Is there a reason? And because journals they have um, they have certain characteristics, right? They they determine who can speak, how they can speak, how you can develop an argument. What is the audience? Um, so the, the media characteristics of these journals, do you, do you take them into account? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, first, about, the, um, about my, my critical position. Uh, 
my third question in, in my proposal of my PhD is actually related to a kind of reconsidering these concepts. And in my opinion, this is mostly about the, the, the situation of architecture in, in Iran that I would like to talk about and, you know, to kind of accommodate these two concepts for the current situation in architectural theory of Iran. Uh, for example, we have uh, in Iran right now institutes and centers devoted to, uh, you know, to circulate the idea of criticality and autonomy in architecture. And, you know, maybe this is somehow funny, but they usually uh, refer to uh, the journals, Peter Eisenman in Oppositions, Michael Hayes in Assemblage, Rem Kulhas in Any, and, you know, these keywords could be found in their uh, articles, in their uh, lectures, everywhere. So first of all, I would like to uh, understand these, you know, the, the origins of these terms to actually find the history and how different interpretations of these two concepts actually were created and were produ produced. And then to be able to uh, give some maybe hints to architects and to theorists in Iran for reconsidering criticality. My opinion actually about criticality is somehow similar to what Hilde Heinen uh, recently published about the different understanding of criticality in Europe and in the United States, which was how depoliticized and decontextualized the, the terms and the ideas of criticality and autonomy actually became in in United States. But and you know I think it it weakened uh, the the capability of architecture. I believe that the European notion, according to Hilde Heinen, could be a better understanding, could be a better uh, approach toward these concepts. And I believe that we need some sort of maybe somehow domestic understanding of criticality in Iran um, because of the context, because of a somehow very different context, and to understand that uh, you know it's, it's not a good example. The American journals are not a good example for us to repeat. So first I would like to understand, and then I would like to give some context to criticality and autonomy in order to be understood more contextual and more uh, actually related to Iran's uh, situation. Mm -hmm. And um, so if, if I do understand you correctly, you are kind of criticizing the discourse on criticality and autonomy in US American journals, and you would like to find um, another understanding of criticality which could be useful in the present. And do you do you do you look at examples of other forms of criticality? Because I mean like the, the, the typical thing, as you said, of the US American discourse, it's it's so much on um, not looking at politics, not looking at the production conditions of architecture, like social economic um, factors, but only seeing criticality, at least for any and Eisenman, seeing it into um, in the, the formal transgression, like only forms and to, to criticize the, the historical tropes of, archite of the architectural discipline. So, but what would be what would be other forms of criticality which could be which could be foregrounded instead of repeating what what they already did in in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I actually believe that, for example, focusing on new ideas in in uh, sociology and philosophy, like focusing on Bruno Latour's ideas about autonomy and about criticality. I believe that we can find maybe some new uh, or, or kind of, you know, a synthesis of what happened in the United States and the, the issues that we are facing right now in, in the world, actually. We have so many uh, urgent, concrete issues to, uh, that should be resolved. And we, the architects, could help, actually, to, to resolve some of these issues. So uh, my idea is to focus on Bruno Latour's ideas right now, and yeah, just proposing some some you know maybe uh, solutions for 
creating a new understanding of criticality, creating a new understanding of autonomy. Because, as you know, we have always this uh, problem and crisis of defining the boundaries of architecture in academia. And also understanding autonomy will help us, as well as the fact that it will activate us to, to, uh, you know, to better uh, act in interdisciplinary collaborations with, with other disciplines. I mean, if we, we know about the, the boundaries of our uh, discipline, if we know about the cap capabilities of our discipline, then we could be uh, a better, actually, actor in, uh, in interdisciplinary uh, you know, researches. Um, Pierre-Johan Dahl, um, please go ahead with your question. Thank you, and thank you, Asan, for a fantastic presentation. Uh, pleasure to listen to your and to learn about your scholarship on, on criticality and autonomy. Uh, I was thinking, I'm, I'm very, very curious. I mean, I remember we talked a little bit about the differences between the European approach and the American approach on, 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 on these terms. And I'm wondering if you will unpack that difference more in your, in your dissertation. Uh, uh, it would be very interesting to know about. I'm also curious to hear uh, when you mentioned Bruno Latour and the, re and the relevance of m more contemporary kind of theories to be kind of matched or, or used to, to enhance a more kind of contemporary uh, 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 approach or a contemporary approach is the wrong word, but it's kind of slightly different approach perhaps on, on criticality on autonomy. And I'm thinking, how, do you see the American or the European approach to, to, uh, to be more useful if you, if you match it with, the, with these directions of the contemporary, like the Bruno Latour or like for a triple O or something like that? I mean, this can of, I mean, yeah. Okay, thank you very much for your question. And it's great to uh, have you here. Uh, about the uh, difference between European and uh, American one. Uh, unfortunately, uh, my focus in this research is not on, on European uh, actually uh, understanding of autonomy. But uh, I can find that there are so many criticism from European theorists and architects to the American notion of autonomy and criticality. One is, is actually the one by Diane Gerardo, that she uh, actually states that the whole idea of criticality and autonomy, especially autonomy, was uh, kind of derived from Manfredo Tafuri's ideas, mm -hmm. and it was all mistranslated when it's actually translated into Eng English language. So this mistranslation and also depoliticizing the, the whole uh, discourse uh, coined by Manfredo Tafuri which was completely actually a political act for autonomy, was also another criticism. So it seems like that the European notion, according to Hilde Heinen, is the one that was uh, more actually uh, sensible to context, to politics, to uh, some sorts of equalities. And her, uh, pro actually her uh, article is also Hilde Heinen's article is about how we can enter some some newer issues like gender equality, like uh, global warming, like the the uh, the issue of uh, sustainability and uh, issues like this to architecture and to actually to use criticality to be critical and critically actually practice architecture in order to uh, consider these issues. So I believe I, I'm not. Uh, uh, actually very very aware of the European notion, but based on the criticisms, I can understand that maybe it should be more contextual. And about Bruno Latour's also, I believe that this uh, focusing on context and focusing on after humanism, not having just uh, the man on, in the center of the world, and understand and you know respecting everything, respecting every. Uh, relation between objects, uh, whether we understand them, whether we percept them or not, I think it's again another, uh, uh, I think, uh, strength of this theory that can help us in um, in reconsidering autonomy and criticality. Mm -hmm. And 
Yeah, like just connected to that, and then we can go to um, um, Sarah's question in the chat. Um, I'm not sure about the categories of US American concept of criticality or European concept, because I mean, even during the time you're looking at, there were like US American theorists who were seeing criticality much different, right? We had all these um, more feminist ori oriented architecture theoreticians. We have also the discourse on um, ecological crisis. And they also define, um, they, they also speak about being critical and architecture can actually have a position in a discourse, but not this very narrow sense of criticality, which is then super disseminated through all these media. And, um, and the same in Europe, uh, looking at the German discourse, it's so much different when, for example, the French at that time. So I was just thinking about um, being a bit, um, maybe these categories are a bit risky. <laughs> mm -hmm, yes, yes. But, uh, you know, I think it's different when we talk about the, the period uh, in 90s, 80s and 70s in American actually discourse about ar architectural autonomy and criticality. I believe that in 90s, when we talk about uh, criticality, as I stated in my presentation, it was already somehow rejected. The, the absolute autonomy was kind of outdated. The absolute criticality was again kind of uh, outdated. And, you know, the start of the post-criticality was uh, at, at in, in 90s with so many different, um, actually, approaches toward architectural theory. But, you know, most of the criticism are going to uh, 70s and 80s, and especially 70s and especially oppositions approach toward uh, architecture, which, which was so radical, so decontextualized. And yes, I agree with you that maybe this is not a very good um, differentiation between European and American after 80s, maybe, or after 90s. But somehow this is this could be relevant, in my opinion, about the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe move to, to Sarah Honaman Ibrahimi's question. Um, I think you can also read it in the chat. So she's asking is whether criticality and autonomy have ever been discussed in Iran or in Iranian architecture magazines? Um, actually, I haven't found uh, any, you know, any consistent project talking about uh, criticality and autonomy. But we have some publications and some articles and so many lectures you know we have so many lectures they are talking about the autonomy of architecture that architecture should be autonomous and for example uh, keywords like i am criticizing the context i am criticizing governments etc but a very uh, consistent project and, and a, a scholarly project in any magazine i haven't found any mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, per Johan Dahl, I think you have a second question, right? <laughs> yes, thank you. I was just uh, referring to your uh, thoughts, Frederick, uh, which I think was very interesting about the relationship between the European and the American um, uh, uh, approaches to criticality and autonomy. And I think there are, I mean, I think there is so much to unpack in this in in this framework that I think Essen is unfolding here. And I was for example, I mean, um, you had uh, you had the formation of the New York Five and and the Whites with our exhibition, which Gerizman was a leading figure together with Colin Rowe, and uh, and that, that was kind of IA US connected. What happened there with Michael Graves, uh, John Hayduk, these guys, but then par parallel you had the you had the emergence of the greys and the silvers, which there haven't been so much scholarship on, specifically not not this not not the silvers. I mean the uh, greys that you had Robert Ven Venturi and the kind of postmodern the, the directions and the silvers uh, were more in on the American West Coast. And there you may I mean it would be interesting to look closer there. You may find these uh, southwestern American kind of environmental movements emerging in those four four formations. So there is, a, I think, there is there is there is an ecology of of, of scholarship to be looking at, uh, you know, to peel peel away to find these these tra trajectories, and that would be really interesting for 
Ethan's next dissertation. Yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Do you want to react to that or? Yes, uh, I agree with Per Johan actually, uh, and about the fact that there are so many different narratives about this period of architectural theory. And, you know, by focusing on the fact that most of these um, articles and these intellectual projects were uh, in some short articles in the uh, journals, as you mentioned, Frederick, and you know, this is like we have so many fragments scattered everywhere, different ideas, different interpretations and different narratives. And just to give a consistent history or give a you know, consistent um, narrative of this history is always challenging, as well as the fact that you won't be sure uh, that this is the this is the one. This is the true narrative that I'm delivering. So yes, I think this this is a very good time for architectural theory uh, and for his for historians and researchers to focus on this time and understand better each each actually approach and each interpretation of these uh, too many concepts. Yeah, and I think it, I mean it is interesting. I mean what you are looking at it's it's a bit like the dominant discourse, right? Which then gets disseminated also to Europe. I. I just wrote a little piece on how um, this French theory infused um, um, architecture theory of the 90s then get shipped to Germany and were like um, uh, influencing issues of Arch Plus and how they they take over this kind of US American dominance and slightly put criticism into <laughs> into the criticality concept and it's it's actually super difficult to um, to um, to counter this dominance and uh, without claiming some kind of oh, but we have like this more we have like this better national debate on on criticality without getting this normative, but still making sure that this was a dominant discourse, and we have to we have to break it up, right? I mean, I, I find it. Um, sometimes hard to get away from this dominance. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. I, I, I think that, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, because of the fact that uh, many journals in Europe were uh, published in non-English languages and I couldn't understand them, I, I don't have a very good idea about what happened in Europe. But, but I believe that at least in, in the United States, uh, it was you know, it, it could be called as something like paradigm, paradigm of criticality, which and, and its relationship to, you know, its core, which was autonomy. So, and, you know, running away from this uh, dominancy, dominance actually was so hard for uh, architects and theorists in, you know, in, uh, in, in the opposition. Uh, ideas. So yes, uh, I, I'm, I'm really curious about the Europe and I hope that I will be able to read your article about the French theory and how it entered in architectural theory of Europe. It's a German. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, Johan. <laughs> no, just a quick thought on your thinking of dominance, Frederica. I totally agree. And I, it's interesting to think about how the influences and texts were kind of bouncing back and forth between the US and, and, and Europe. I mean, the IA US, they translated uh, Aldo Rossi's uh, The Architecture of the City, they brought M M M Manfred Tafuri and they translated that text. So there was a lot of, and I mean, Peter Eisenman had grabbed Derrida and uh, Deleuze and was kind of, you know, pulled into that discourse. And then it was bouncing back to Europe again. And yeah, yeah, there is a dominance, but I think the dominance is really Euros, Eurocentric Anglo-Saxon dominance. I mean, and there is a critical aspect, I think, to to enlarge that that field. I mean, and that's perhaps is is a very positive thing that ASN is taking this to, now to to Iran uh, to challenge this kind of Eurocentric or Anglo-Saxon kind of Euro-Anglo-Saxon kind of dominance in 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 bounds in in influencing its it, each other. Perhaps there is a possibility to inject something else um, through other 
through uh, Middle Eastern cultures or, 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 or uh, you know, other, other geographies. That would be really interesting. Mm -hmm. Just a thought. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it's certainly a period of translations. And, and isn't, um, so what would you think, it, I think you, you're kind of arguing for some, some kind of potential of criticality nowadays, right? Like s somehow bringing it into the present. So do you, do you see this criticality as being based in, um, in architecture projects or is it more um, architecture history or architecture theory or um, people on the street reclaiming architecture or, or the, the urban fabric? I, I wonder like on which, on which level do you see the potential of criticality? Mm -hmm. Uh, first, yes, I agree with you about the fact that I believe uh, this is a very good time for us to actually go back and look at that period of architectural theory, uh, because you know it's it's somehow after twenty years of uh, we, that we have lived in post-critical era, and we know that there are so many problems again with uh, post-criticality, and also it's a very good time for. Uh, I mean, criticizing interdisciplinary uh, approaches in architecture and uh, to look at architectural autonomy and architectural criti criticality in order to better find uh, maybe new ideas and a new energy for uh, architectural theory. I believe mm -hmm. in criticality, first of all, in actually in, in the state of discipline to be very helpful and very fruitful for us, the architects in academia, that we are free to think about different ideas, about somehow very cutting edge um, ideas, and you know to theorize and produce new theories based on the fact that okay, we we have we had the critical period, now we have the post-critical period, and we have so many problems. So how we can actually make a synthesis, synthesis of this, of the dialectic between these two periods of architectural theory in order to produce new theories, in my opinion, mostly based on, on the context of, for example, Iran. And then uh, based on these theories, maybe it would enter uh, architectural practice uh, after some years, maybe. And maybe it will actually help architects and people to understand this uh, criticality and understand the, the effects and consequences of this new approach. So I believe in in starting this project in academia and you know just being free to think about maybe a new way of autonomy, a new way of criticality, and some new ways in practicing interdisciplinarity. Because what would be the critique of the, um, I think we, we are almost approaching the end, but just, I, I'm just curious. So what would be your critique of interdisciplinarity in Iran? Or do, I do understand you right, right? That you are against the, the current form of interdisciplinarity. Oh, not, no, no, I'm not against the current form. Actually, I consider myself as a person who believe, uh, an academic who believe in uh, interdisciplinarity. But actually, I think that we can criticize it. We can think about the fact that we have some issues, some political issues, some issues around environment, some issues around economy. And some of these issues are actually could be addressed by architects. And, you know, uh, let's talk, for example, about the 2030 agenda, in, I mean, worldwide. We know that our deadline is so close and we have lots of things to do with architects, I mean. And we have to be more active in, in this interdisciplinary worldwide project. So I believe that by a constant criticism of uh, our methods in interdisciplinarity, it could help us to, you know, to be more active and to better actually uh, perform in, in interdisciplinary researches and practices. So I believe in criticism and being critical, uh, and I think that would be, that would be helpful for us. Mm -hmm. I think this is a very nice closing, mm -hmm. <laughs> closing mm -hmm. statement. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, Ethan. Um, thank you for being here with us. It was really nice. And um, 
this was the last CCSA talk of this um, semester. So um, we will keep you all updated about the current, uh, the, the upcoming, upcoming semester. And um, thank you everybody for listening and being with us. And I, I wish you a very nice evening.